Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this panel on West London's housing and infrastructure priorities and the role West London will play in the UK's recovery from COVID-19. Um, I'm joined today by David Luntz, who is the Interim Chief Executive Officer at the Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation, Kath Shaw, the Deputy Chief Executive at the London Borough of Barnet, Alice Lester from the London Borough of Brent, and Lauren Thanya Kittical from ASAL Architecture. Uh, so with the government's mantra of build, 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 the housing and infrastructure sectors are in the spotlight. We're going to be talking about the key projects in West London, the opportunities and challenges that these projects face and how they're going to adapt in the new normal. Um, I've also been asked to mention that Capital West London and WSP ran a roundtable last week, which was on uh, infrastructure investment in West London. Uh, that report's been published today, and you can find a link to that in your digital programme or on the conference app. Um, a final bit of housekeeping. Uh, there is a Q&A function um, if you look at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. So if you have any questions for the panellists uh, throughout the session, then please feel free to, to drop those in and um, I will do my best to, to ask all of them. Excellent. So um, on, to, uh, on to the panel then. Uh, so we're going to start with, uh, with Kath Shaw. So the first question I'd like to ask is, with your dual role uh, in the West London Alliance leading their Build and Recover programme and, and your role in Barnet, um, how important do you think the delivery of both housing and infrastructure are to uh, West London's recovery? It's absolutely massive, isn't it, Helen? I mean, we, um, I should say, uh, as, as Helen said, yes, I'm currently seconded part time to the West London Alliance to lead the Build and Recover program. And within that program, as I think some of you will have heard already from, from David Francis this morning, we did identify seven themes of which one, housing and infrastructure was, was hugely important. Um, West London um, delivers on housing. Um, you know, people talk a good fight across London, but actually we've been consistently meeting our housing targets. We've got some amazing schemes in the in train, um, on the ground and in the pipeline. And actually, by and large, they've survived pretty well through COVID. Um, I think we have seen most of the schemes took a small pause, but most of them have picked back up again. And so I think uh, as we as we hit a time where, you know, lots of industries are shedding jobs, construction um, and our housing and growth agenda is going to be massively important. Excellent. So um, what are the key projects then, both for, for Barnet and the, the West London subregion as a whole? Right. Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Helen, because I would really like to show you some uh, briefly show you some drone footage of our scheme at um, at Brent Cross. Um, I did a, a present I did a presentation that was chaired by Mark Easton and asked him for feedback. And he said I put too many words on my slides. So I thought I would uh, go to the opposite extreme and just um, tell you about Brent Cross by showing you a video. So hopefully you can see this. And what you can see there is Exploratory Park, which is the first deliverable from the project. Brent Cross is um, going to deliver a new town centre for northwest london um, and right from the very beginning when we procured argent related as our joint venture partner we wanted health and well-being to be absolutely at the heart of it and you can see at the top of your screens there that enormous green space clitter house playing fields which gives the project a real um unique uh, usp that it can develop and, and build that health and well-being agenda around the other really key um, deliverable within the scheme, which actually the council is delivering on its own, not in joint venture with Argent Related, is um, the, uh, the, the new train station at Brent Cross West. And obligingly at this moment, a train should be appearing across the top of your screen so you can see where the train line is. Um, and as you'll see, uh, there's a cleared space at the top of the screen in the middle there. That's where the new station is going. That's on the Thameslink line. And we'll get people to St Pancras in 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and that's a Thameslink train actually itself. So that would be stopping there in, uh, in a couple of years time opening in 2022. You can see here that the phase one site is largely assembled and um, this footage is about a month old and we do now have vacant possession of some of those last sheds where you can see old vans and things pulling in and out. Also I think as the screen pans round um, it'll lift up in a minute and you'll see the other half of the site, the phase two half, uh, which takes us all the way out to the A41 which is the row of traffic in the background and off the left of the screen there you can see Brent Cross Shopping Centre. You, so you can see how fantastically well located it is um, by road for uh, the A406 and the bottom of the M1 um, and also for, for shopping. I think uh, you know a lot of talk at the moment about 15 minute neighbourhoods. Um, we were always really clear that this town centre was going to be a 15 minute neighbourhood. You know, 
neither neither a dormitory, suburban dormitory, nor a place where um, where people just jumped on, you know, where, where people were there in the day for the office buildings and then went home. So Canary Wharf, I think, um, certainly in its early days, always felt a little bit dark at the weekends and we want to avoid that. Then you can see in the background a complex of Toys R Us and Tesco's. Uh, that's the phase two part of the site. So I guess, um, you know, health and well-being, as I say, was always at the part of it, always at the heart of it. And I think that makes us really resilient to um, to COVID. So as people have spent more time in lockdown, spent more time working from home, they've realised that actually having access to green space, um, you know, not being kind of cramped up is an incredibly important part of, of their well-being. And, and I think that and our kind of aspiration from the outset to build a low carbon neighbourhood mean that, you um, I mean that we're really well placed to deliver that and as you can see it's it's all starting to happen and I think if I've timed it right that's going to be ending any second now so I will um stop talking about Barnet obviously Barnet's got other projects Brent Cross is our is our main one as I say in partnership with Argent Related and actually you'll start to see Argent Related if you're in the office market coming to market with um with some some sites and some opportunities um through the autumn so I will now switch if uh, possible just to talk a little bit about West London mm -hmm. um, probably should have done West London first but I was over excited by the prospect of my drone footage um, so this map um, is a little bit messy but hopefully actually gives you a bit of context for the whole of um, of, of the um, West London subregion and its major project areas. So you can see um, here Brent Cross, as I was talking about, obviously we've got David on the call, who's gonna to talk to you a lot about Old Oak Common. And then we've got colleagues from other boroughs. So Alice, I'm sure we'll talk about Wembley and other places. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about, cause I only really do have a, a minute or two is the West London orbital line which will go from, from Hendon and West Hampstead here in the northeast and track all the way down. Um, and I suspect actually you might find, depending on where your uh, bar of speakers is, you can't quite see the bottom, but takes you all the way down to, to Hounslow in the, um, in the southwest. And that is an incredibly important piece of infrastructure for us. Um, takes the pressure off the North Circular, which is, you know, we're all trying to reduce the amount of traffic on our roads for climate and air quality reasons. It connects some of those, all these light green um, spaces are the, are the London plan opportunity areas the purple are being considered as new opportunity areas it connects all those together it enables us in this post-covid world to get all of those workers to um to new jobs to new roles in the in the growth areas across the sub-region it's also in rail terms incredibly cheap and quick to deliver so um about 500 million pounds um including some contingency and risk so you don't get a lot for your money on the railways for that but you do get the west london orbital line it will unlock 10,000 additional homes, addition to all of those uh, flagged in the existing opportunity areas. And it could be open by 2027, possibly 2028. So, um, you know, it is a real deliverable, practical um, scheme that, that ticks multiple boxes, which I think will be exactly the kind of thing the government's looking to support um, in the, the post-COVID world, because it really does enable us to start to, to lead that recovery um, here in West London. And I will stop there if that's all right. Excellent. Well, that's uh, that's great. Really useful to see uh, see that in action and see what we're sort of looking at geographically on the map. Um, that's great. So um, moving on to David, then um, obviously um, the the old oak park is is your uh, yeah your big scheme. So first of all, what uh, what, what stage is that currently at? Myself. Sorry, I'm on mute there. Okay. Sorry, Helen. Thank you very much. And. Um, Really good to hear uh, Kath's update on, on the wider West London scene and what's going on at uh, Brent Cross. Um, OPDC, Old Oak Park Royal, it's a fascinating area because uh, a lot of it is obviously the Park Royal Industrial Estate, which uh, a lot of people don't quite understand the size and significance of this. It's the largest industrial estate in London. Um, it services a huge amount of the London and wider southeastern economy, something like a third of all food is processed through Park Royal. It's a really, really crucial part of London's economic infrastructure. And uh, OPDC, part of its job is to work with businesses uh, and local communities there to try and um, uh, support and sustain those businesses and enable them to flourish. And very importantly, to do as much as we can uh, working alongside um, the three boroughs that um, are part of our patch uh, and other agencies to try and ensure that um, as many opportunities as possible are available to local people because 
Um, Old Open Park Royal is an area that's fascinating, but is also quite challenged in many ways. It's one of the poorest uh, parts of West London. So the Park Royal Industrial Estate is very important. The other part, though, that's really crucial in terms of the regeneration and housing ambitions is all of the land around what will be the new high speed to interchange station, which, mm-hmm. as colleagues on the call will know, has now got the go ahead from uh, national government after a great deal of um, prevarication and delay. Um, but if you go down there to the site now, um, there are cranes all over the place. Uh, the HS2 station at Old Oak Common is one of the biggest construction projects anywhere in the country at the moment. It's a station that's going to be uh, spending well over a billion pounds to create this incredible new interchange that will bring not just high speed to, but um, cross rail the Elizabeth line and the Great Western line into a, um, a strategic interchange. And we know as well that for a number of years, um, Old Oak Common will be the terminus for HS2 until the link to Euston is completed. So this is really going to change our area quite dramatically. Uh, this is going to be the largest new station to have been built in the UK for well over 100 years. Um, its peak capacity is going to be something over a quarter of a million passengers a year. And it's going to drive, we think, um, some really quite fundamental changes to this area of West London that has been, to some extent, overlooked and neglected for quite some time. It certainly gives the um, potential for a tremendous amount of new housing. So we have housing targets at OPDC for 25,000 homes or more over the next 20 years, um, some of which are already on site, which is very exciting. But alongside that, it's not just about housing units. It's also about working with businesses, employers and investors to make sure that we create a new district here with this incredible public transport hub that not only speaks to the need for new housing, but also speaks to the need for new jobs, and new ways of living and working perhaps more closely together. And I think it's a really fascinating time because we've not only got this major injection of new funding for infrastructure with HS2, but of course there's so much debate and discussion at the moment about what will a post-COVID London start to look like. And I think projects like Old Oak Common, and I dare say as well um, uh, Brent Cross and some of the other big West London schemes, have really got the opportunity at this stage to address those questions very creatively. You know, what will new housing need to look like? How will it operate alongside not just work, but leisure and opportunities for people to live in really high quality environments where they can go about their business, whether it's work business or enjoying themselves in ways that feel safe, secure, enjoyable, and have high standards of amenity. So we at the moment are finalising our local plan, which we need to do because we want to make some major changes to the way that we utilise land in our patch. Um, We hope to get that uh, nailed down over the next 12 months or so. Alongside that, we're working with a range of investors to get some early delivery sites away. So we've got about 1,500 homes uh, either on site or about to start. And we're spending a lot of our time working with the business community and our local boroughs to try and support um, uh, businesses and employers uh, and our communities through some of the uh, current stresses and strains of COVID. Excellent. Well, that's that's a really useful up, update, David. Thank you for that. And um, hopefully we'll get on to some of those questions about the, the post-COVID world um, later on in the session. Um, but for now, on to, on to Alice. So um, Brent obviously has a impressive housing delivery programme. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, the delivery of that and, and talk us through some of the key projects? Yes, certainly. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Bear with me. I'm still learning at this. Um, so let's see. Has that happened for you? Yep, good. Nodding heads. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is going to be a very brief Whistler's Top Store, as the others have done as well. But this first slide shows you Brent's growth areas. So we've got eight of these identified growth areas. Uh, there are two new ones. Our local plan is on its first day of the virtual examination as we speak, actually. It just started an hour or so ago. Um, So two of these uh, growth areas are new, so they'll be under particular scrutiny. Um, The one at the top left-hand corner is Norfolk Park, which is a one public estate initiative to deliver about 1,600 new units. Uh, But the main one I wanted to focus on is the Neasden Stations one, sort of in the um, centre-ish, because that's quite crucial in relation to the West London Orbital, which you will have already heard about from Kath and 
will no doubt be hearing throughout this conference. Um, just for context, so the Staples Corner growth area is opposite the Brent Cross development that Kath talked about. Um, and the West London Orbital, we hope, will be coming through on the red line through uh, Neasden stations, where we hope there will be a new one. So that is, um, right, next slide, sorry, why is that not uh, working? Okay, so this, so we are doing a master plan for the Neeson Station's growth area. Now this is partly in relation to the hoped for forthcoming station, but we recognise that this area needs a bit of work and development as a growth area, even without the West London Orbital, if that doesn't come off. But we're, we're really hopeful that it actually will, um, with a new station to potentially unlock um, more housing land across London, but also in Brent. Um, but I think more importantly, as the others have just alluded to, it will really open up orbital access for people to travel around. And it's particularly important with access to jobs in West London. We have got the Piccadilly line, which goes out to Heathrow, but this will, it will be transformational, I think, for people. I don't believe that people are going to stop travelling to work and everybody's going to be at home because a lot of people in Brent's economy can't work at home because of the type of jobs that they do. So we've been doing some master planning work. Now, um, I think this is fairly unusual in this day in that we've actually recruited somebody in-house to do the master planning rather than going out to get a consultancy to do it. Um, we're very fortunate to have an excellent master planner. We're fortunate as well in that it's partly funded from the GLA through the Home Building Fund. We got some money specifically to do this. It's quite interesting because it's a combination of strategic uh, still land, the significant industrial land, and local else is the locally significant industrial land and other things, including a waste transfer station, which is part of the West, Lond West Northwest London Waste Plan. So it is quite complex, but we're hoping to integrate all the principles of good growth into this um, and uh, unlock up to about 2,000 new homes. So that's quite significant for us, and it's, it's work that's progressing uh, really well. Uh, but we do other things as well. So... I mean, a lot of the focus is on housing, but we, we mustn't, it's not just about the numbers, it is about the places as others have alluded to, but the council is quite proactive. So we've got a Wembley housing zone and we're currently pursuing, we have a uh, subject to GLE socially sign off, but we have um, a big scheme in the Wembley housing zone, which will again will be quite important for that area, a mixed use scheme, 250 units, partly affordable with workspace, community space and public realm. It is a high quality scheme because we want to set an example as a council led development that that we can do this why don't you why don't you follow us and do a good good development throughout the borough um, we are doing infill on our council houses infill sites which will amount to about a thousand new units new homes i should say not units homes on small sites south kilburn regeneration we recently had the successful um well recently a year ago now uh, biggest uh, ballot in london uh, with 74% turnout and 82% voted in favour of it. We have a Brent-owned company. And more interesting, I think, and this is where the council is showing itself to be uh, different from some councils, not all, but we have purchased 500 units in the past nine months from a combination of Telford in South Kilburn, St George's in Appleton and Quintain in Wembley Park, the latter being a block for specifically for key worker housing. Um, and, you know, they're an absolute bargain, to be honest. It's much easier to buy them you know, off plan already built or being built than it is to build them ourselves. So uh, I think that, that's something that the council's really proud of. So one of the questions in the brief was about ha um, has infrastructure played a big role in bringing the schemes forward? I mean, it's a bit like, you know, duh, yes, you know, it has to, um, because it is about places, not just numbers. Um, there's been massive investment in infrastructure. I mean, we're not it, you know, in Brent, we're an uh, inner outer London borough, so we haven't got sort of old, really industrial brownfield sites that are in the middle of nowhere. Although, to be honest, if any of you are old enough to remember going to Wembley Market before the redevelopment of the stadium, it did feel a bit like you were in, well, you were in the middle of old industrial fields um, and things. And so, so that has been absolutely transformed in Wembley Park. It takes forever, though. I mean, we're sort of a bit over halfway through a 15 year programme. It'll be a bit like the Brent Cross scheme in Barnet. I mean, it just takes a long time. Um, Grand Union, we've got 3,000 units in St George's um, being built out, but it, it has to come with infrastructure to make it work. And that is a combination of the private sector of St George's providing it, but the council working on what is needed. And in some cases, um, 
we have put 17 million pounds worth of uh, strategic still into the Wembley Park public realm improvements and in South Kilburn which is a council-led scheme obviously there's a lot of public money going into that um, but some of the challenges well uh, these will be familiar I just wanted to Talk a little bit, though, very briefly about the bullet point two about the public perception of growth. So Appleton is one of our growth areas and there are lots of schemes coming forward or in the pipeline. And there is a rising tide of dissatisfaction from the local community who we have tried to involve in the planning for all of this over the years. But we all know how hard it is to get people engaged at plan making stage. But they they're objecting to the developments on the grounds of basically what's in it for us. You know, what's the infrastructure infrastructure for us? And when you actually try and tease it out of them, or well, what is it that you actually mean by that? They talk about doctor surgeries, schools, and the tube station. Now, doctor surgeries, well, we're, we've integrated one into the Alperton scheme. Uh, we're hoping that the CCG will actually stand by that and help with the delivery because it's actually not our gift to deliver. Schools, well, our school place planning shows actually we don't need more school spaces. We're building a new secondary school. We've got enough primary schools. Um, uh, and the tube station, well, that's within TFL's gift and we're trying to get step-free access, but it's, you know, it's, it's quite hard to do. But it, it is important, I think, that we really just have to keep on working and working harder about delivering, you know, something that benefits the local community um, as well. So priorities for development and infrastructure for Brent, well, obviously it, it's housing and it is employment, particularly at the moment with the um, dreadful situation that we find ourselves in and some people find with the, the loss of jobs or lack of access to new jobs. So it, I, I've titled that access to employment. So in part, that is our is us providing or facilitating the provision of a variety of workspaces. But it is coming back to the WLO. It is making sure that people can get to work in a sustainable and hopefully affordable way. And that so the WLO is a really, really significant on, on many levels for us um, to make sure that that happens. Active travel, obviously, lots of boroughs doing it. Um, the active travel plans, which is meeting some resistance from people who don't like to be told they can't drive down streets. And this has been alluded to, but the public realm, I mean, the significance of open space, um, access to private and public open space has really taken on a new prominence, I think. So whilst we've always tried to integrate good public realm into our developments, I think it's really come up the agenda um, for Brent. OK, that's it from me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alice. That's um that's really helpful. Um, so on to uh, Lauren then. Um, so obviously you're you're on the sort of architecture and, and planning side of things. So um, how can we ensure that we build enough homes, but that that's done in a viable and, and a sustainable way? Um, hi, Helen. Um, thanks for having me here today. I think this is something that um, the previous speakers have actually spoken about quite a lot. I mean, predominantly the availability of land and the opportunity for enhanced infrastructure are really key to creating these sustainable built environments that we need to meet the needs of existing and new communities. I mean, we're seeing a large increase in public sector land being released for housing. Um, and I think even as Kath mentioned with the Brain Cross, you know, with the private joint venture partners, it seems to be an incredibly successful way of bringing houses forward. Um, one of the examples we've been working on is TFL's new joint venture with Granger, Connected Living London. Um, that's seeing a portfolio of seven incredibly well-connected sites come forward across London on disused railway sidings, overstation developments, and commuter car parks and ancillary to the tube, the tube stations. Um, we're also seeing a lot of new bids coming forward um, on council-owned lands. Uh, councils are looking for private partners to help bring forward development. Um, these sites are often quite constrained due to their central locations, um, often overlooking railways, busy roads, odd kind of leftover shaped pieces of land. So good design is vital in mitigating these constraints to enable the delivery of a really viable quantum of homes and other uses, um, public realm and um, public parks, while providing a meaningful public space that creates these success, successful spaces where people really want to live, work and enjoy. Um, there are many benefits of the kind of public-private JV. One is the affordable housing that gets delivered through the fast track route um, on public sector land. Another is these partnerships deter any kind of developers who have no intention of delivering homes, but really want to just kind of bank a planning consent, optimize land value and sell it off. So this results in delays to delivering housing. So really these public-private JVs can, can see the vision realized. Um, and that's what we think is working incredibly successfully on projects we're on. 
Mm, excellent. And just, just briefly, then, before we move on to the more sort of general discussion, um, I wanted to ask you what role the build to rent sector plays, because obviously there is a lot of that in West London, particularly if you look at well, the, the big example is Wembley Park. So um, how important is that going to be for, for West London? So, I mean, the build to rent sector should be playing a really crucial role in providing this housing that is needed across West London and the whole of London, really. It attracts um, alternative sources of capital into the house building market, and it really raises the game and improves the quality of the housing um, on offer. Um, there's a rising amount of renters in London. We know that. Um, build to rent offers a much better quality product that's professionally managed, has excellent customer service. Um, and really, the last six months of COVID has shown the importance of these high quality homes, this amenity space, which we can come on to a little bit about how it's been adapted um, you know, for COVID and how it's being used safely, um, and the security and rent, such as build to rent. Um, it can be delivered faster than housing for sale, as it doesn't have the risk of market saturation and phasing. Um, you can also build bigger schemes because you need to drive the economies of scale to so get more housing delivered quicker. Um, and it really offers a great choice for customers in the rental market, allowing people to live in more central, well-connected areas. But it also provides this range of amenities so people can work from home, not necessarily in their house, but maybe in the amenity spaces, still be part of the local community. Um, and also the public realm and the, you know, the landscape courtyards that come with these developments are really, um, you know, a big sell for them. Mm, absolutely. OK, well, I'm going to move on to some more general questions then. And, and again, to uh, to all the delegates, do please feel free to uh, to weigh in in, in the Q&A if, if you've got any questions that you'd like to address to, to any of the panellists. Um, so first of all, obviously, goes out saying there's been a lot of change in everyone's priorities in the past few months with, for example, sort of people working from home and, and maybe even considering moves away from the capital. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask was, does West London remain a great place to invest in and to build homes and and why um i don't maybe uh maybe we could start with david on that one you're obviously building uh building a lot of homes in west london yeah exactly helen and, and um i think there's little doubt that um west london does remain a very important place for building many new homes and um as colleagues will be aware you know london has not been building enough housing for not just years but arguably decades so there's a big backlog as well as uh, additional demand coming, you know, on a, on a year by year basis. So we do need a lot more housing and we certainly need a lot more affordable housing. Um, there's no question at all about that. So I think whatever the um, whys and wherefores of COVID and all the speculation about, you know, will people continue to want to live in London or work in London? I suspect that we will find that London is a good deal more resilient and adaptable than some people are suggesting at the moment. Um, London's come through many crises over many, many uh, decades and centuries. But I think that there is no doubt in my mind, though, that there's going to be an increasing emphasis on the type of housing that's built and the type of amenities and space that people can enjoy. I think, um, you know, some of the challenges that we're seeing now with people really struggling in very small um, homes sometimes uh, with uh, little access to outdoor space. Um, I think we're going to see um, additional emphasis on building quality and, and, and a really important emphasis on public realm. So I think there's little doubt that we will continue to see new housing built at scale. I think, if anything, uh, the expectations and the demands around that are going to grow, as we're already seeing from some of the uh, uh, early indications in terms of government planning reform. There's no doubt at the moment that uh, this government's going to be looking for more housing to be built in London, not less. Uh, but as I say, I think there's going to be more uh, emphasis going forward on design quality, on public realm, on local amenity. And I think it's also going to be very interesting to see whether there's perhaps going to be more emphasis as well on bringing work and leisure and housing closer together. Uh, and perhaps a bit less emphasis on, you know, this um, tendency for people to have to commute into central business districts. I'm sure that will continue. But my guess is that some of these West London locations that we're talking about with very good local transport access, good access to local public space and amenity. And in terms of projects like mine or projects like CAS or projects, some of the big projects that Alice is working on, the opportunity really to start to think about um, development at scale where we can plan in some of these new approaches to living a life that may be slightly different from the one that we've been uh, um, uh, living pre-COVID. So yes, I think West London is going to be absolutely essential in terms of housing delivery over the next decade or more. 
Excellent. Does anyone else have any thoughts on what West London can offer specifically um, in, in the kind of new normal? Maybe one of the, the panellists from, from the councils could uh, could give us their thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to jump in there, Helen. I mean, I think David has, has said it very well. I think um, West London has a huge amount to offer that can lead um, lead the UK out of recession. And that means we'll always be an attractive place to invest. Um, I actually think it, it, COVID has, what COVID has mainly done is accelerate a lot of trends that were there anyway. I don't think we're seeing new trends. I think we're seeing um, a much sharper focus on things that we knew that were happening. So the need to reposition our town centres and what they're for, the need to think about quality in housing, the need to think about um, neighbourhoods where you aren't car dependent because um, you know we know that air quality and, and climate are so important. And I think the acceleration of all those trends, uh, actually, as well as being, you know, a very challenging time and, and a lot of people are really struggling and there's lot, lots and lots of downsides. There are also opportunities here. I mean, this could very easily be the saviour of the outer London suburban town centre um, as, as you know, people realise that if they're only going into the office a couple of days a week, what they want is is a is a to live close to a town centre where they can get the access, as David says, to the amenities that they need. Um, so I think we will start to see more and more of our housing coming into those town centres, bringing the life back into the town centres and, and, and kind of creating that sense of community in the town centre in a way that perhaps we lose it a bit when everyone's just commuting into the central area. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm optimistic amongst all the gloom. Excellent. Well, that's a, that's good to hear. Um, OK, so looking again at some of the key development opportunities, I know they were mentioned in, in a few of the presentations. Um, but I'd like to ask what, what kind of homes are being built if we sort of look at development in West London as a whole? And uh, who are those homes being built for? Who, who should they be being built for? What, what kind of housing do we need in, in West London? Uh, yeah, so I don't know if Alice maybe wants to, to come in on that. Yeah, well, I think um, David's already covered the, uh, you know, the massive need, which is just not going away for affordable housing and, you know, as in socially rented or one of the other uh, similar products. Um, you know, we we know that we're at the start of the unemployment uh, rise. We know that unemployment often leads to homelessness, you know, to evictions and defaults on mortgages. So we are expecting the house um, housing crisis to get even worse and and dreadfully dreadfully sad. So that is an absolute crisis. And I think there's a real combination. So there's the straightforward, you know, social housing from the residential provider or the council. Um, we have just started talking about whether the council needs to build, build um, our own houses and multiple occupation just because and at the moment with the private rented sector we are putting people in private rented sector units but to be honest the quality is you know it's not it's not great so we might want to start thinking about doing that if that's a possible option um, I I also have this thing so people People talk about, you know, is it genuinely affordable? And people have this idea that if it's not affordable housing, as in that label, it's luxury housing. And I, this people object to planning applications saying, you know, it might be a small redevelopment for nine or 10 units and people describe it as luxury housing. And I think it's not luxury housing. It's very, very ordinary housing that happens to be very expensive because of the state of the housing market. And I, I look at... Um, my two older children are in their 20s and all their friends and a lot of my staff and probably a lot of people in and on this call or watching this call who feel that the housing market because of the house prices is completely cut out as an option to them and I, I feel that's a real missing cohort in the debate about how you make because my children are never going to be on a council house waiting list and they're privileged enough to, to not uh, not be in that position um, so they do have access to their own resources but they still can't afford somewhere and I, I feel that that whole discussion about, you know, access to house building and you could equate that with wealth, you know, that, that those of us who are older have been fortunate enough to acquire through their house building purchases, that, that, that we really need to look at that cohort of the population, um, you know, in a way which, and I, I don't know what the answer is, I'm not an economist and, you know, I know the housing market and house prices is incredibly complex and I don't believe it's a simple case of build more and the price will come down because I think it's a lot more complicated than that. That might be part of it, but it's not. So, yeah, lots more housing, lots more affordable, lots more of all time types of housing to be honest and that includes the build to rent sector it includes the um the co-living model although i think the co-living model has been brought into sharper focus with covid as how would you cope in lockdown if you were living in a room that's 16 meters squared um so yeah sorry a bit of a ramble there but those are my thoughts 
No, not at all. That's a, you bring up some very good points there. And actually touching on that design point, um, this might be one for Lauren. Uh, I wanted to ask whether you think we'll see changes in the design of housing um, due to the pandemic um, in West London and, and indeed in, in London as a whole. And, and what kind of things might architects need to, to look at? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's going to change, I think. Um, but, but as everyone's alluded to, it was changing anyway. Uh, this is just really, you know, ramped it up slightly. So we really need to look at this in the setting of the home, the building that you live in um, and the community you live in and the wider context as well. So the reality is in terms of the wider context, on a larger scale, we'll be seeing more activity in the neighbourhoods. As we touched on, people want to be living, working, playing, relaxing, exercising without having to drive anywhere, potentially without having to commute, um, you know, very long distances, especially if people are only going back into work central a few days a week, maybe, you know, this is going to become more important to them. People want to be close to the things that they need rather than relying on the travel. Um, and I think more generous, carefully considered public realm with small changes like um, separating people a little bit more to make it easier to protect them. Restaurants potentially spilling out into parks, you know, so that people can social distance without having an impact on, you know, reducing the amount of people that can work and people that can go to these places. So I think in the bigger context, those are the changes that we're going to see quite quickly coming forward. And these bigger schemes are the opportunity to do to do that um, in terms of zooming in really on the building. I mean, people are very conscious about how you use the spaces. Um, a big focus is how you access them, how you move around um, how you interact with other people in these spaces. One example we're looking at in a lot of detail is mail collection systems, you know, just to take out the middleman to make sure that there's less interaction with people in that way. Um, another one is you know, better ventilation, air extraction in the apartments and in the lifts when people can go in them, you know, fewer at a time, that sort of thing. And then when it comes to the actual apartment design, I mean, we get asked a lot of the time if we're going to see less open plan living spaces, you know, are we going to start creating more cellular living rooms? Um, is that where we're headed? I think fundamentally that's a huge shift. From where we are, open plan is still the most effective layout type as it offers more space. I mean, you've got people working from home on their own. They're happy to be in this kind of hub in the apartment. But what we are starting to see is a lot of people talking about having a two-bedroom, three-person or a three-bedroom, five-person apartment where you've got that smaller single room that can then become a home office, but you've still got your dining, living, kitchen all working together. Um, so I think flexibility is key. So I think the mix of units is probably going to start changing a lot more um, rather than the actual design um, of, of the homes. Brilliant. I think uh, Alice wanted to briefly uh, come in on that as well. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. I, I mean, I, I think about this quite a lot and I don't think I've arrived in my own head at a conclusion, but this is about the COVID response and changes because um, we are in a changing world. And I, I think we can't, really talk about a post-COVID world because we don't know that there ever is going to be a post-COVID world. But at the same time, let's not rip up some of the things that we're doing well uh, and change them. Now, I've, I've worked in planning for 30 years and there's been an increasing uh, recognition of the needs of mental and physical health in the built environment, which is, is fantastic and a really important thing. Um, but it, and part of that has been that we are designing places that aid social interaction. And so, and I think a move, I'm worried that there might be a, a response to reducing that and encouraging social isolation. And I think that would be a really, really bad idea. I don't think it's going to be that extreme. I think what um, uh, the, Hannah, was it Hannah? Sorry, was just saying, you know, actually was, was meaning that that's going to happen. But I do think we don't want to throw the baby out of the bath. Oh, Alice, I think you've gone on to mute. Were you still uh, were you still talking? No, I'd finished. Okay, Sorry, so I muted myself. We will, we will carry on. Um, so I wanted to move on to talking a bit about infrastructure. Obviously, that's something that came up in... Um, in a few of the presentations, we've actually had a question from Stephen McDonald, who has said, one of the common themes coming out of the presentations is the key role of infrastructure. I'd welcome the panelists' thoughts on how we can do more to secure the funding we need for the key infrastructure that we need for growth. Um, would anyone like to, to come in on that? Uh, maybe one for Kath on the, on the council side or David? 
Oh, I think David was indicating, but I would just say yeah. a very, very short answer and then hand over to him. Um, I think the combination of um, TfL being in a really, really tough place and um, the government being very focused on levelling up means that we're going to have to get more creative about where our money comes from. Um, so I don't think we can afford, if we're thinking about perhaps building affordable housing as, as well as infrastructure, to be sniffy about private sector money now. You know, We're going to need to get the patient capital from wherever we can because the government will have so many spending priorities, so many pressures um, and so much kind of uh, pressure to move outside London that we are going to have to get creative and not just rely on public funding in a way that perhaps we've become quite used to. But I'll hand over to David. David. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure Kath's right about, 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 uh, about needing to get creative and she's certainly right about um, the crisis facing TfL, which I don't think any of us should underestimate. I mean, TfL has been such an important contributor to housing growth over recent years um, through upgrades to the tube network, new stations and so forth. And um, I think for the next few years, that's going to be a lot tighter for reasons that we all understand. I think infrastructure is really important. And I'm glad Stephen put it into the chat because it's absolutely critical. It's critical for at least two reasons. I think one, because infrastructure is quite an expensive thing. And it's not easy to find the money for it. And secondly, of course, because infrastructure usually has to go in up front. So it also really starts to hit the cash flow for uh, developments that otherwise could be viable. Um, and as Cass has sort of alluded to already, there's often this interplay between infrastructure cost on the one hand and affordable housing on the other. So it's quite a complicated um, set of variables here. I think on the, on the, on the more positive side, because um, it's easy to get a bit depressed about this, I think at least government has acknowledged the importance of infrastructure and it's been very well trailed, I think, that there is likely to be a new single housing infrastructure fund that's going to be announced by the Chancellor in the next month or two, we hope. And um, all the indications are that that is going to be quite a substantial uh, capital programme, probably bigger than the um, current housing infrastructure fund uh, budget and probably over a longer period of time. So I think that is very welcome. I think the other one that's going to be a very interesting thing to watch, um, and this may play into Kath's point about how the public sector and the private sector play this together, um, and I hesitate to sort of step into this, this place, but the planning reforms that government uh, are playing with and are about to um, uh, take through the legislative process um, say some quite interesting things about new approaches to um, infrastructure levies and also suggest, I think, that... Um, if those infrastructure levies are introduced at a local level, they will be, uh, it will be possible for the public sector to borrow against the cash flows that that then creates, which I think could perhaps speak to the idea of some more public-private partnerships to do some of these longer term, more complicated and more expensive schemes. So I think there are some, there are some things coming down the track, which I think could be potentially quite useful and interesting. Um, but as, 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 as is indicated by the question, this is a major, major problem for London at the moment, not having a, 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 a serious and flexible infrastructure funding budget. Great. Thank you, David. Um, and I think there we've been talking about transport in infrastructure, but something else mm -hmm. I want to just briefly touch on was... Um, digital infrastructure and, and the importance of um of that does anyone uh, does anyone want to come in on, on on the digital infrastructure piece uh, i think maybe one for uh perhaps alice or, or kath i mean is there anything councils are doing in, in in that vein to improve the sort of digital infrastructure I mean, yes, we ha we have got a a, um, a rollout of digital digital infrastructure program. I must admit, I'm not involved in the details, but I know it is one of our sort of borough plan visions to make you know, to increase connectivity. Um, and we are specifically doing a project in the South Kilburn Estate Regeneration to make sure that uh, connectivity is is integrated into the new developments in the public realm. There, um, yeah, and, and I think it brings us back to the whole thing about changing in in workplace patterns that people, you know need to be able to access high speed internet you know when they're working from home or from the cafe or the library or whatever open place they can find um uh, yeah so i think it's really important but i'm, I'm sorry i can't talk in detail about brent's problem no. So, uh, jump in with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm really glad you asked the question because it's incredibly important. And actually, in terms of bang for your buck, um, digital infrastructure is a much more 
cost effective to put in than, than some of the big, you know, we, we talked about 500 million pounds being cheap for a rail line. Uh, you don't need anything like that for, for um, 5G and fiber. Um, I know that um, Finn, Finn Kelly from the West London Alliance is in the audience for this call. And if anybody does want to understand in real detail what West London are doing, Finn absolutely is the expert. Um, but for those um, those who are on the line from, from councils, there are some really simple things we can do as well, like putting in place way leaves that make it, uh, you know, it sounds quite dull, but it makes it much easier for for, um, for companies to roll out fibre um, to, to premises. And so, you know, really simple um, kind of regulatory things that we can do to, to sort of smooth the private sector in, in um, rolling out the, the digital infrastructure that we know we need. Brilliant. Thank you. So on, on that infrastructure topic, um, we're going to have a quick poll um, which all of the delegates are, are able to vote on. So you should see that uh, coming up on your screen now. Um, so we'd like to ask what form of infrastructure you think will be most important to West London's future growth? Um, so is it new and improved rail links, for example, the West London Orbital, improved digital connectivity, new homes, new commercial space, for example, offices or industrial or social infrastructure? So um, if you'd like to vote on that now and we should have the results in uh, fairly soon. Excellent, but for now, um, I'll carry on with the uh, with the questions. So, what the final thing I wanted to ask was um, obviously with more homes comes a need for for more jobs. So, I'd like to ask, and we, we've had a question about this in in the Q and A as well um, about the role of uh, sort of commercial development in in the future of West, uh, West London. So, Simon said in the chat, would uh, residential workplace developments not provide new affordable 21st century workspace and residential accommodation, but also be economically viable so what thoughts do we do we have on that shall i come in on that and i'm sure sort of david and kath might want to come in and lauren um yeah i mean that's exactly what is happening on a lot of locally significant industrial land i mean we, we, this is all within the context of the planning policies in the london plan um where strategic industrial land is not uh seen as suitable unless it's done in a master planned way like we've been considering at staples corner as well um so i mean co-location can work. I mean, Seagrow and Neil, who lots of you have probably heard speak, is, is very keen on this and they have demonstrated it in some cases, but it does depend on quite a lot of things like the size of the site and your footprint and the type of industrial employment uses and what their floor ceiling heights and servicing needs are, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it's not just as straightforward as carving up a site and saying, right, industrial here, residential here. Um, but it's certainly something that is, uh, I won't say flavour of the month, but it's certainly ev evolving and becoming part of the dialogue and part of the delivery solutions to improving employment floor space and providing residential. But I would point out um, that not all sites are suitable for co-location. And we still, and it's not all about the number of jobs that you can get into an office space. It's also about industry, warehousing, logistics and um, whilst you might have a warehouse that doesn't employ many people at all is very land hungry we still need space to provide those kind of jobs and services for people and um, we still need somewhere where the dirty smelly uses can go because that is part of our industrial fabric and they probably aren't uh, suitable for co-location thank you Excellent. Um, so I think we've got the results of that poll in. They should be showing up on your screen now. So uh, the majority of you have said that new and improved rail links are the most important uh, form of infrastructure to West London's growth. That's 45%, uh, followed up by improved digital connectivity, then social infrastructure and new homes and new commercial space, both on 10%. So, uh, yeah, big, big majority in favour of uh, the, the sort of transport infrastructure. OK, so we've got about just over sort of uh, five minutes left. Uh, David, did you did you want to come in on something? Well, just quickly on, on the jobs thing, yeah. um, because this is really important question. I mean, I agree very much with Alice. I mean, there is still going to be a need for you know, larger footprint, um, uh, more traditional industrial and distribution areas. I mean, logistics is obviously a major, major issue uh, and, and waste and recycling and other things. I do think, though, that, that one of the interesting things to watch, um, going back to this point about how will we, uh, how will make my preferences start to sort of shift in terms of where you live and, and how you work? You know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if what has been quite a long term drift of you know, corporate offices into either the city or Canary Wharf or 
more recently, the London Bridge area, the central business district. I don't think those places are going to die, but I can see an awful lot of opportunities uh, for corporates to disperse uh, some of their kind of workforce, not necessarily just to working at home, actually. Everyone's talking about working at home. I think there's a real, um, there will be an emerging market, I'm sure, for more kind of suburban or peripheral uh, work locations that are either branded by the corporates. So, you know, maybe PwC will have an office in one of the outer London suburbs or a number of them, or indeed, are we going to see a move towards more kind of shared workspace uh, where people are not necessarily working at home, but they may be working, you know, a few hundred meters from home uh, and they may be sharing a WeWork type space with all sorts of other people. And I think that sort of model may well start to emerge as being something which is both, you know, quite popular with people who don't want to commute into town every day, but don't necessarily want to be working in the kitchen uh, and also potentially quite an investable proposition and really good actually, to some of the suburban centres and high street locations, which we've been told for so long are on their knees. I think this actually might be a bit of a rebirth of some of those places. Mm, excellent. That's a really interesting idea. Thank you. So we've got about five, minute le- five minutes left. So um, I'm just going to go around now to each of the panellists for their final thoughts. Um, I think the final question I'd like to ask you will be, what's the key driver in ensuring that the projects and developments we've talked about can move forward? So uh, I think we'll start with Kath. Um, that, I think that's a really hard question because you, you asked me for one and I've been of thinking of so many candidates I think probably if, it, if I have to choose one it will be confidence um, confidence in London as a city I think uh, there's a, a danger that the, the trouble that the central area zone is having at the moment in terms of um, you know the, the theatres being closed and the uh, tourism being down and it being very quiet is, is dominating the narrative about London in a way that is really risky for outer London. And absolutely, we need to recognise that there are, you know, eight, nine million people that live in this city, that they are all going to, there'll be a bumpy time, but they are going to continue to be economically active, productive. Um, it, is, it is a phenomenally resilient city. We need to kind of keep our faith in it, keep moving forward and, um, and make sure we are talking about the opportunities as much as we're talking about the problems. Because um, if, if we lose confidence in ourselves and in our city, then, then it will be much, much worse. Mm, OK, so stay positive. Excellent. Stay That's positive. a very good message. OK, um, on to David. Totally agree with Kath. I was going to say something very, very similar. I think, you know, opportunity favours the bold. And I think it's all about confidence and leadership, I think. Um, You know, I don't know what all the intricate answers are going to be to how London remains as investable as possible in a post-COVID world. But all I do know is that we've got some raw material to work with in this city that almost nowhere else in the world enjoys because London has this extraordinary reputation and resilience and adaptability. And it's the best, probably the best brand in the world if you're into um, urban policy and regeneration. The absolutely key ingredient is leadership and optimism and confidence. So I think I'm completely at one with Kath on this. Practical Mm. optimism should be our watchwords. Excellent. Uh, Alice, your... uh... Your views. I mean, you know what they said. So I couldn't have put it any differently or better myself. But and I, but I think just to add to that, uh, positive optimism. Was that what you said, David? I like that. Um, I think it is recognising the role that local government and the public sector generally, so development corporations and um, and other organisations can can play in holding the ring on this. And I think you know, Kath alluded to the success of West London authorities working together and delivering on their promises. And I think. Um, I think we can carry on doing that and that the public sector needs to be the ones to bring the confidence and the positive optimism and the leadership uh, working with the, the private sector and investors, et cetera. But I, I think, you know, despite our financial challenges, um, paying the cost of COVID, I think that, uh, you know, local government's in a really good place to, to mm. keep uh, London's head held high. Mm. OK, excellent. And uh, finally to, to Lauren. Oh, I think you're on mute, Lauren. Sorry. I think I agree with what everybody's saying. I think fundamentally it's going to be about working together, all of us, public, private, to design really good, timeless places um, with good public realm that people really want to live in and to make sure that all these places that we're bringing forward are of the highest um, design quality that we can do. Mm. 
Brilliant. That, that's great. Well, I think um, we're just about out of time. So all that's left um, is to say thank you to the panellists. I think that's been a really in interesting discussion. Um, so we've talked about it seems like the important issues are sort of making places that people really want to live and to work, these sort of multi-purpose communities, but obviously also making sure that developers and councils really sort of bring bring communities along with them and um, infrastructure clearly a, a huge uh, a huge item on the agenda. So that's one for for everyone to to keep an eye on, I think. And um, I think we ended on a really positive point talking about the need for that sort of confidence and positivity in in the public sector. So plenty, uh, you know, plenty of challenges, obviously, in the current environment, but it seems like there's lots of positive things to, to take away, too. So that's that's great. That's uh, that's the end of this session. So the next one up is uh, on the renaissance of the local high street. So I'm going to now hand you over to your next chair, Mark Faithful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.